All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So if uh, people want to go ahead and, and take their seats. Okay, so uh, welcome. I think most people know me by now. Kai Poehler, Texas a University, and then have uh, Dr. Mara Benelli from University of Florida. And, and the idea in this section is very similar to what we did in the section that we, that we did this morning. So if you were in that section, you're going to see the first part is a lot of repeat here. Um, but then we're going to move in to talk about things from a more basic point of view um, and really to, to build from the ground up of how the estrous cycle works, how estrous synchronization works, um, and not starting uh, where, where, we, where we did this morning. So I mentioned this slide earlier, um, why we're really here is, you know, we have these genetic goals that we're trying to accomplish. And, you know, the way to get that into a herd is through uh, reproductive technology injecting those genetics into the herd. And so the big thing is, you know, if you think about estrus synchronization and AI, the power behind it and being able to use that to inject that into a herd faster than if we allowed natural service without estrus synchronization uh, to make those things happen. So again, genetic gain is what we're after. How do we accomplish that? Well, we have accuracy now coming in the way of genomic testing um, and we're not where the dairy industry uh, is today, but we have pretty good accuracy on, on some of the EPDs and some of the traits that we're measuring from a genomic point of view that allow us to be able to make accurate decisions um, in the types of animals we want. We're gonna always have genetic variation um, that, that we can't necessarily control, but we can control selection intensity and we can control generation interval. And both of these can be driven by the use of reproductive technology. So for example, if you use uh, IVF, um, or embryo transfer, you can drastically decrease um, generation interval because you can use younger parents, turn over those uh, progeny faster, or something uh, uh, from selection intensity by utilizing AI and selecting genetics to go into a herd. So reproductive technology, um, I would say, is the main driver of genetic gain, if we think about it at the end of the day, um, and really important. Number of factors that affect ester synchronization and fertility in our cow herds. Uh, you heard Vitor Mercadante talk about this. You heard the panel talk a lot about this. Um, facilities, for example, you have bad facilities, stressful for the animals, stressful for us as the people breeding the cows. It's a challenge, right? So having those facilities pair with that is something that um, we, we sometimes forget about but is a basis for having a successful program. They don't have to be nice facilities, they don't have to be covered facilities, et cetera, they have to be functional, okay? There's a difference between functional and the most expensive facilities in the world, right? But there's a number of other factors. And I think kind of what we wanna do today and what Mario and I are gonna talk about is some of the things that affect these different factors, all right? Some of the things that affect the success or not to these estrus synchronization protocols and really how we got to the point of having Estrus synchronization protocols and time AI protocols today. Now, the thing is that the pregnancy itself is very complex, all right? And so really what we're after is how do you increase success to a single ovulation? How do you increase success to these type of programs that we have? Because we're gonna lead up to a story of getting to the programs we have and how they are successful but we wanna increase success that we are having to these reproductive management programs today. And as you just look, this is day 21 of pregnancy. This is day 31 of pregnancy. This is the uterus here. This is the inside of the uterus. Here's the embryo, these red outer layers here. Here the embryo is in green. You can just see how much change has happened in 10 days, right? So it's a rather complex process to get to this point. So the question is, where do we all start? Okay, so what is estrus? What does estrus even mean? And Mario's gonna tell us a little bit about estrus and, and moving into the estrus cycle. Thank you, Kai. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, right? We're trying to synchronize estrus, but it's, it's, it's good that we try to understand what estrus is. And uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm gonna pretend that nobody here was in the previous uh, talk. So you will see, I'll talk to you as if you've never heard anybody talking about these things before. So estrus, as we can observe, is a behavior. And that is, that is it, uh, do we have light? Oh yeah, here. Uh, that is the, the 
uh, fundamental behavior they were trying to look for an animal and say that that animal is in heat or is an asterisk. That is, it stands to be mounted by a bull, or in this case, by a hermit, by another heifer. Is she an asterisk? We don't know. It's impossible to know. Uh, unless you observe that she's been mounted by another one of that cohort. Now, this one here, she's standing to be mounted. She for sure is in heat or is an asterisk. So asterisk is a behavior. So behavior is something that's in the brain of the animal. So the animal at that stage of the astro cycle, uh, it's completely okay of standing up, standing, not moving to another animal trying to mount on her. On the other 20 days of that same astro cycle, 20 days and a half, she's not gonna let that happen. If that other heifer or a bull or any other of the cohorts try to do this, try to mount her, she's just gonna run away. So it is a behavior that has a very limited time within a about 21 day astro cycle. It will be between, let's say between eight and 18 hour, hours duration that you will keep doing that, keep standing for some other animals to, to mount her, but not more or less than that. And everybody here seen a, a, a cow or a, or a heifer in asterisk? Have you seen that behavior? Okay, that's good. Now, that behavior, it, which is allowing another herd mate to mount, standing to be mounted, repeats on average every 21 days. And that is the interval of an astro cycle. The most basic way to define an astro cycle is an interval of time that takes for an animal to show heat like that, and then to do it again. During those 21 days, she will not allow herself to be mounted. She will not exhibit that asterisk behavior anymore. So it is a behavior that about every 21 days will repeat if she's in good health, if she's well-managed, and if she's not bred. If you just leave her in the pasture, you can count on it. Every 21 days, she will repeat that same behavior. How does that happen? Why is it 21 days? So it, it is not random. It is not 12, 37, 24, 16, 2. It's always that same interval. It repeats itself. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Why does it, uh, why is it always the same? And the reason is because it is highly regulated process. So asterisk detection. If you have a herd of animals like these, and you try to, to see which ones are in heat or, or which ones are going to come in heat, you know, you can be looking at them, they'll be looking back at you. You're never going to figure it out uh, unless someone is standing to be mounted. And again, because it's about 21, 20, 21 days of astro cycle, you can be sure that if they are cycling at every day, 5% of your animals will be in heat. Next day, another 5%. Next day, another 5%. And that's just because I'm taking 100 divided by 20, that's 5%. Five. 5% 5 of them will, will do that. So uh, how do we detect asterisks? So the old way that we see is the cowboy on top of the horse, looking on the pasture with a little you know, uh, notepad, and oh, that's cow 2027. 20, so she's accepting to be mounted right now. So this is, this is the old way, visual observation. If you have a huge herd, that will be impossible to do. If you have a smaller herd, yeah, maybe, sure. Um, what, what are methods that are available for estrus detection? And I'm going to talk about some that we are using now experimentally. But before that, I'll let Kai talk about the ones that we are using all the time, both in operations and in our research operations. Yeah, so... You know, when you think about estrus detection, and just like Mario mentioned, um, if you sit out every day and watch a group of cows, 5% of them will come in heat, 5% more the next day, 5% more the next day. And so it takes a long time and to catch all those cows in heat. So one way is we use estrus detection aids or breeding indicators to make that happen. And, and um, we particularly like to use estrotech patches 
So what we do is we score those patches on a one to four system, which is right here. So if zero to 25, and, and if you've never seen one of these patches, there's there's some out at the Estrotec booth or, um, that are outside, but it's basically like a lotto ticket almost, but a thicker material. So if you scratch it, some of it comes off. The more you rub it, the more you scratch it, the more it comes off and the fluorescent color underneath um, active, or, uh, becomes apparent. So as we get increased estrous activity, this patch starts to rub off and we score these on a scale of, of zero to four or one to four. And we classify them as having low or no estrous intensity or having estrous intensity. In all our studies, we score loss patches as zero, but I'll tell you, we've, we've put on, I don't know, probably 50 thousands of these patches uh, in experiments that we've done. And we lose less than 1% of them when they're applied correctly. And so, you know, if you just follow the instructions and, and uh, use them appropriately, you shouldn't have any problem uh, getting them uh, to stay on. This is what they look like on the back of a cow. So here we have a, a patch that's not activated. Here you have a patch that's slightly activated. We'd still consider this a score of one. Here you have a patch that's a little bit more activated, a score of two. Here you have a patch that's a little bit more activated. You can see it's rubbed off. You still have some not rubbed there, patch score of three. And here we have patches that are completely rubbed off and fully activated at this point. Again, here's another example of, an, of a patch that's activated this, um, this heifer sliding off the back of this one. So basically through a lot of work, these patches have been developed to determine that, you know, not one time when the cow jumps on and slides off that it completely activates. So it's a, it's a pretty precise uh, technology in regards to the activation uh, for detecting estrus. We've shown a number of years ago um, in large data sets that you get an increase in fertility as you go from a patch score of one, patch score of two, patch score of three. And this is a larger data set where we summarize data in Brazil and in the United States, basically showing that if you go from no estrous activity to estrous activity, you get a very large increase in fertility. And in the US data, you can see if you go to a fully activated patch versus these that are not fully activated, you have a big increase in fertility. So estrus is really important, all right? And, and, you know, when we think about these protocols, we really have developed them so that we can get animals to show estrus. The more animals we can get show, to show estrus, the better off we are in regards to what's happening. Yes. So the question is from the audience, what's the difference in the data from Brazil to the United States? So there's two things. Um, one is a lot of Bosomicus cattle in this situation. Um, and the second is differences in protocol use that we use in South America versus what we use in the United States. So the, to really just simplify it, if a, if a cow doesn't show heat to the protocols we use in Brazil, for example, there's, there's a major uh, issue going on compared to protocols that we use in the US. So there's, there's, there's less room for air, let's say, in that situation versus the protocols that we have in the US for synchronizing cows. Um, in a very simplistic way to think about it. The other thing is that we noticed um, is that these animals that have low estrus expression not only have a decrease in getting pregnant, but they have a decrease in maintaining the pregnancy. And like one of the worst possible scenarios is, so think about you have a veterinarian come palpate your herd, cows are pregnant, and then you turn them out and they lose the pregnancy. So that actually costs you more money than a cow never becoming pregnant and just culling her from the herd because you thought all that period of time that she was pregnant and that she ended up not having a calf, et cetera, and ended up open. So we, we were really happy to see that this was the case. And this is what those patches would look like in this situation here. So not activated or slightly activated versus uh, almost completely activated. And so at that time um, in 2018, uh, we launched this uh, new product with Estrotech where basically these black dots, which is called the breeding bullseye, um, represents 50% of the patch. And so when that 50% of the patch is rubbed off, you get into those patch scores of threes and fours, right? So you don't need to score the patch on a one, two, three, or four system. You basically know that if this black is gone, these patches right here are gonna have better fertility and lower pregnancy loss than these patches right here. So it allows you to use it as a management tool for those type of scenarios. So you can make decisions behind the cow, or you can make decisions in your operation based on how activated or not um, that patch might be. And you might say, well, why is that important? This is just a set of data looking at differences in, in sire fertility. 
Vitor, can you uh, fix that? So this is differences in sire fertility. So there's about 2,000 cows in this project. Uh, we have cows that were in estrus, and we have cows that were not in estrus. We have Angus bulls here, and we have Bostonicus bulls. Look at the difference in how these bulls perform versus if the cow's in estrus versus when the cow's not in estrus. So 30 percentage points difference in these bulls right here, 10 percentage points difference right here, although this bull is not too good in the cows that show estrus. But right here, these bulls didn't perform, they performed above average in the cows that did not show estrus. So the point is, when you pair these type of data with the estrus expression data, you can make real management decisions. It's not as simply as saying the cow showed estrus or not. We can potentially use different sires. We can potentially use sex semen. There's a lot of situations that you can utilize them for. For example, if you're just doing natural bull breeding with estrus synchronization, put a patch on, you estrus synchronize the cows, you put a patch on the cow, and if the bull rubs off the patch, you know that cow was at least mounted by the bull or, or another set, another cow, right? So very simple things that can be utilized um, from, from that point of view. So with that, oh, you got to click it now, Vitor, because you um, took it away. So there's a lot of technology that's evolving in regards to um, herd management and um, the basis for estrus synchronization. Um, we're going to get it to work here soon. How many PhDs does it take to work a clicker? Okay. So um, now I'm going to ask Mario to share a little bit about what they're doing from the research side with some of the other technologies that are available and on the market um, with more data collection, et cetera, and what that might look like and what that might mean. At, uh, at this point, the, uh, uh, does the audience uh, understand the asterisk concept and why it is important? You know, we're talking about the, the, the topic today is synchronization of asterisk, but we wanted to show you asterisk first. Okay, before we synchronize, it's something that happens naturally and occurs. And if the cow is not in estrus, she's not going to be bred. So if you if 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 we if what we want is a pregnancy, a positive pregnancy outcome, she needs to be in heat first, uh, or at least to be to to highly successful to be able to to get pregnant. Yes. That's right. Uh, well, I'll. I'll, I'll I'll talk about that. So very good. So, so this is a system that we're just starting to work now at the University of Florida. So this is a system that's already well used in dairy. Uh, there is one paper published uh, in beef, and we just it, it was done at the University of Florida, and now we are we are doing that experimentally for one of our trials. And it uses a collar. It's called the SCR collar system. So this is uh, what it looks like. This is Daniela. She's applying the, the color in one of the cows. This, the, uh, this is the actual cows of my experiment. So this is how it looks like. It stays right there. It's very close to the ear. And it collects data continuously. And that data is from an accelerometer. So she's moving. And so we know how many steps she's doing. And also rumination data. Because it is close to the neck, I guess you can sense how the uh, uh, feed is uh, going, uh, the feed is, is going back and forth and, and records that continuously. And it makes a baseline for each cow. So it takes the data, it, uh, it's, uh, uh, it accumulates the data for the whole day in that color. And as it gets close to an antenna, it downloads that data, it goes to a computer. So every day we have data for each of the cows on the computer and it makes a baseline. Whenever the cow gets out of that baseline, it's a sign of heat. And the baseline includes an increase in number of steps because the cows in heat, they walk more. And also, very amazing, and I'll show you the data, they will, they will have a very sharp drop in rumination. So it's like an increase in movement and a decrease in rumination. And those two things, when they show up together, it's a very clear sign of asterisk. So then at, at this point, you can be in your couch, just looking at the app in your phone, and you'll have a a notification when a cow shows heat. So we are we are discussing this with uh, with people here from the audience that you know before you had to be watching and being with the animals. At this point, it might start to get to look a little bit different. You get a signal in your app, and that will be a very strong signal signal that the cow is in the heat. Um, this is how the 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 system looks like. 
uh, here's a, a building with an antenna and a computer. And that antenna has a range to as much as 1,500 feet or 500 meters. And then as the cows come in range, the, 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 that will allow the color to be red, you send a signal to the computer and then it will compute and it will send a message if the cow was in heat and when was she in heat. This is the actual picture of, of our system. This is a 60 acre uh, pasture where our cows are located. The only uh, place they have to drink is right here at this water trough and is strategically on the range of the antenna, which is located right here at the corner of this building. And here's the antenna, here's the computer. And then as the cows come to drink or to eat because their feed bunk is right there, uh, the cows will be red and will receive a notification. This is kind of like what the, the kind of, of signal that, 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 that we have. This, the, uh, these are three different cows. So this is uh, steps and this is rumination. And that's what you're looking at, an increase in steps and a decrease in rumination. And that will tell you the moment that the heat started. And that's a heat that lasted for 18 hours on this cow, 12 hours in this cow or eight hours in this cow. It's not foolproof. It, needs, it's, it is like self-validating every day because it is running that baseline for each cow and see if she's on that baseline or if she's the, or she's uh, varying from that baseline. But at this point, we do use AstroTech as, as our golden standard and the correlation is 100%. So whenever we have a signal like this and we look at the cow back, her AstroTech has been rubbed, she's a three or a four, she has shown heat. The difference is that we we'll know the exact moment that AstroTech has started and that is important for our research and experimentation. So this is kind of like maybe where some of us will go in the future. It is commercially available. It is commercially available. Um, I think it's Merck. Is it Merck? Yeah, uh, that, that are, they're are doing this. Uh, there'll be some limitations. For example, what we would like to do is to have like another antenna right there or strategically located in the pasture so that they wouldn't have to be exactly at that point to be able to read their colors. We just didn't do that because we are cheap, but eventually we'll get there. Now, estrus behavior, some more to it, Guy. Yeah, so, you know, we talk all about estrus and estrus detection, et cetera. But, you know, one of the things that, that I think really want to highlight in this section and is talk about differences between Boss Indicus and Boss Tyrus face females. So we know they look different, right? One has a big floppy ear. Sometimes they have a hump. And others, you know, Boss Tyrus don't have that. But they have a lot of differences in their actual physiology. It's the reason they don't respond to protocols the same. It's the reason that a lot of differences that we're going to talk about for a lot of the rest of the talk happen between these females. So one is that estrus behavior in Bosonicus females is very different than it is in Bostaris. It's shorter, and a lot of times there's actually published data on this. They express estrus at night, all right, and the interval is shorter. So it's harder to detect them in estrus, all right, compared to Bostaris that normally have a um, a, a shorter uh, duration, but higher intensity. Um, and there's a lot of factors uh, that go into that. So if you just look at a Bosonicus uh, female compared to an Angus, you know, there's a lot of positives here. We're adapted to tropical environment, um, you know, less uh, severe reduction in feed intake, growth rate, milk yield, and reproductive function, resistant to parasites. On this side, here, we have tolerance to heat stress, very efficient for food production, and reach pretty a lot earlier age. So there's positives and negatives from both, and we make these composites like Brangus, like Beefmaster, all these other herds that have a little bit of Bosonicus and some Bostaris in them, and you start to blend these together. And that's really what we're trying to do when we generate these types of breeds uh, that, that fit within this. So puberty, for example. Puberty in Bostonicus females uh, is, is uh, they're later maturing. So um, on average, we consider them to, to reach puberty about two years of age, although there's been a big push, not only in South America, but here in the U.S. for us as well, to try to get those females to reach puberty earlier through genetic selection and, and, inten and intensive selection. Um, a lot of times, you know, one of the big, big situations here, and if you heard um, uh, Shelby talk in her last talk about uh, supplementation strategies, pushing heifers, et cetera, development. A lot of times these animals are in very, very poor quality forage and they're there 
because they can survive there. They're adapted to that idea. They're adapted to that tropical and subtropical nature. But we don't have the same resources that we might have in a more temperate based climate. Bostara space uh, heifers reach puberty a little bit earlier and more intensive selection pressure. If you look at Angus, for example, we've been selecting in Angus for good or for bad for about a hundred and something years. And the most common breed in Brazil is Nalori. Okay, it's like like Brahmin, but a different Bosonicus breed. Um, uh, uh, that heifer right there. Major genetic selection pressure for puberty has probably only really happened really strategically in the last 15 years. So there's 100 years of genetic selection on Angus versus very limited selection pressure for puberty. And I would even say it's maybe less in the American Brahmin breed. So these are things that, that we can do, but take really strategic um, situations to, to make that happen. And also we know that a heifer that becomes pregnant earlier in life has increased lifetime longevity and profitability to the herd. These are trade-offs that we have to make between environment, interaction, tropics, not tropics, et cetera, and how these come together. So attainment of puberty, Shelby did a really nice job talking about this already. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, and I'm not a nutritionist, so I'll embarrass myself if I start talking about too much nutrition. But one thing that we can do to assess pubertal status of heifers is use a reproductive tract scoring system, where if you have a tract score of one, that's a prepubertal or infantile tract, and those need to be culled from the herd. Um, and, and Luke um, from ST spoke about this this morning, the strategies that they're using in Brahmin heifers. This is exactly what they're doing. Twos are prepubertal and they're greater than 30 days from puberty. Threes are peripubertal and they're, they're about 30 days or less from puberty. Fours are pubertal and five is pubertal as well. So we want at least 50% or more of our heifers in this three, four or five stage. Because if they're a one or a two, it doesn't matter if Mario and I go there together and we bring all the drugs that we have and we try to do magic, those animals are not gonna come into estrus. They're not gonna respond to the synchronization, synchronization protocol and we're not gonna be able to get them there. So one way that you make progress is you cull these animals from your herd and you utilize these, all right? Or you totally change your management strategy and how you're getting heifers prepared for the breeding season. And it has a direct result in, in pregnancy rates and in these animals that, um, that are in these increased reproductive tract scores. I think Mario has some data uh, later on in the talk. The higher the reproductive tract score, especially those heifers that are fours and fives have increased fertility um, in these programs. So long-term solution, genetic selection. Genetic selection is also slow. How do you get there? You push it through reproductive technologies. Okay, so it takes time. Um, other things we can do is crossbreeding, right? That's why the composite breeds like Santa Gertrudis, Beefmaster, Brangus, those type of breeds have become so popular because you can make a lot more progress in a short period of time by crossbreeding those genetics from a subspecies point of view than working with the actual pure boss syndicus itself. Short-term solution, nutrition, programming, Shelby already talked about this, hormonal treatment, which we're gonna talk about, and technology. So pairing those together. Estrosynchronization synchronization is a technology, okay? It's a combination of drugs, and, and Mario's gonna talk about what's in the toolbox. It's a combination of drugs that's utilized as a technology to move animals forward within a herd. The other thing that's very different about um, Bosonicus influenced females is they're more susceptible to stress, right? Um, one of our colleagues, Hinaldo Cook, has spent a career working on this in regards to susceptibility to stress and has shown over and over again that these animals are more excitable um, and that the very excitable animals have decreased fertility, increased pregnancy loss, and decreased return on investment within your herd. So if there's a crazy female in your herd, the best thing you can do is cull her. Um, it just makes everybody's life a lot easier in the overall situation. However, these animals are very efficient in the ability to survive in the tropics and subtropical climates. 70% of the cattle around the world are located in tropical and subtropical climates. It's why I love Bosonicus cattle, right? So look at this here. This is a, a group of Nolori cows, all right, that were fixed time AI to Angus bulls 
to produce these F1 calves here. If I took an Angus bull and turned him out on these ranches in Brazil, those, those Angus bulls would maybe survive a month or two before they keeled over. They just won't survive. But through fixed time AI, you can accomplish this right here where you generate the F1s, which are way more efficient at producing a terminal product uh, from a, a carcass standpoint and, and meat quality standpoint. So, you know, a lot of factors that go into heat stress, a lot of factors that, that um, go into making them more efficient in that system and, and is one of the things that we really uh, like about them. I already talked about these across breeding um, and mating Boss Taurus and Boss Indicus. So it, it, it's what, you know, really this part of the U.S. survives on, right? If you think about the type of cattle that we have close around us here and as you move south from here, you see Boss Indicus, Boss Taurus crosses all over. And, you know, sometimes they're this big, sometimes they're this big, sometimes the ears are this big, sometimes they're this big. We see a lot of variation, right? But it's all, and, and, um, and Mario has some pictures of the, the multi-breed herd that they have at, at Florida. There's a lot of variation in the way that these animals look, but they're very efficient in being able to survive in this tropical, subtropical based climate. You know, the big thing that has drastically changed uh, Boss Syndicus influenced females is reproductive management and reproductive technology. So there is some strategies that have specifically come about to be able to induce animals to go from not showing estrus, what Mario talked about, to being able to cycle and show estrus, you know, and do things like generate, take these Nori animals here, that when they start the breeding season, none of them are cycling, but use an estrus synchronization protocol to get them cycling and to breed them and get acceptable pregnancy rates. So the question that it really comes up is, you know, what does estrus look like in a normal production system, Mario, when you don't use any estrus synchronization, and how does that play out over time when we think about efficiency? So the, the, the transition here is that estrus, as we have been uh, um, uh, exposed to so far, is an individual thing. As an animal, one cow, a one heifer, she's an estrus, she's not a estrus. So we're kind of looking at one animal at a time. But how does it fit into a production system? So let's take a look still at one animal, and, and that would be like her reproductive life cycle. She's born, and then she attains puberty. If she's a heifer, she starts ovarian cyclicity, so that kind of gets into everything that that guy is talking about. Then she, sti she, she starts having natural cycles. You know, in a production system, that should not last. We don't want her to be showing a whole bunch of estrocycles. cycles. We want her to, we want her to be bred and to start a gestation through insemination or natural service, and then conceives, gestates, and go all the way to parturition. Of course, during this course, there'll be opportunities for fertilization failure, early and late embryonic death, and we already know the, uh, uh, how far that can go based on some of the data that Kai showed, or abortion, that's more related to disease. And then at the end, she'll give birth to perhaps another heifer that will go through that same cycle or a bull. Um, uh, but herself, she'll undergo after that parturition to a period of postpartum quiescence. That means she's not cycling. That means what we call an estrus. She's not undergoing estrus cycle. And in, the, in, the, in, in, in a normal female, they'll, they'll last like 30 days, at least, sometimes 60. And if it is a boss indicus, all the way to 120 days after parturition, that she will still be under a postpartum quiescence and will not be cycling. Then, then she will start again uh, at, to cycle again, and then hopefully she'll get inseminated or, or, or natural bred, and then undergo that cycle again. Now, what is the incidence of anestrus? If you go to on the beginning of the breeding season, you're ready to breed your cows. What is the proportion of them that are cycling and that are not cycling? So uh, for postpartum cows, about 64% of them on, that, on, that, on, the, on, on these two studies would be cycling. If they are two-year-olds, a little less, 55%. And uh, if they are yearling heifers, that means if they are just starting to the breeding season for these two studies, about 83% of them will be cycling. And the difference of 100 will be the ones that are in, in anastrous. That means they are not cycling. So think about that in a production system standpoint. 
beginning of the breeding season, and they, in the, if, if you're not inseminating, if you're not, if you're not inseminating, if you're just using bulls, means here are the bulls, open the gate, here come the bulls, start breeding, guys. Yes, but there will be a proportion of cows that will not be cycling. And it's not the presence of the bull that reduced them to cycle. They still have to mature. They have to finish that postpartum quiescence and then start cycling. So you can think about that in a breeding season situation in which, in which you have a limited number of days for these cows to get pregnant and there'll be a proportion of them that are not cycling. They are not showing estrus. So this is the challenge here. The challenge is that uh, you like to marry the time that they start cycling with the beginning of your breeding season, because this is how much time you have. After that limited amount of time, that can be you know 90 days, sometimes 60 days, sometimes a little bit more, but it will be less efficient. But in a reasonably efficient system, 90 days, here the bulls come in, here the bulls come out. That's the opportunity that they'll have to get bred. If you think about it a little bit more, based on what we heard also today, you like them to be bred as early as possible in the breeding season. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Well, uh, this cow here that gets bred early, she'll also calve early. And because the winning, the date of winning of calves is usually is the same, the ones that calved earlier, that got pregnant earlier and calved earlier, they'll have the win a heavier calf. They'll bring you more uh, dollars to your pocket. So uh, I usually show, I'm not, I'm not gonna dwell a lot of time on, on this, but, but I, I like to show this because again, this is real data from our operation, University of Florida. And I show here for 2018 to 2020, the actual dates of our calving season, the breeding season, and this is the date of winning. And it is a management decision for us that the calves would have to have at least 210 days in order for them to, we would like them to, to, to be at least 210 days at winning. And you know, the first calf that was born here in the calving season, that calf was 200 days of age at this point here. So that he still had all of this time to continue growing until the moment of winning. Why was, why did he calve so early? So let's go here. Why did this, the, the first calf that hit the ground was right on this day. How did that happen? Because on the previous breeding season, her mom was the first one to get bred. So that cow that got bred on the first day was the cow that delivered the first calf on the calving season. Why did she breed so early? Because she was cycling. She was ready to be bred. Okay, she, if she was in an asterisk, she would not be able to get bread. So just think about those concepts and all the way to the moment of winning, because at least in Florida, with lots of cow calf operations, that's the moment with the selling of calves that the producer will put money on his or her pocket. So you want it to be as heavy as possible. For that, you need to be born as early as possible. And for that, you have to be bred uh, the, the, their moms as early as possible. So what happens using crossbred cows with no synchronization and just bull breeding? What is the dynamics of pregnancy attainment during a 90-day breeding season? This is what it looks like in reality from a study. So in the very beginning, 0% of the cows are pregnant. Then you open the gate, put the bulls in. Then, you know, the pregnancies will, will trickle down. See, this 20 days, 30, 40, 50. Man, it takes a long time for those bulls to just go ahead and breed those cows naturally with no synchronization. Just as they are showing heat, we do what frequency? 5% a day, remember? 5% a day coming heat, they breed. Next day, more 5%, they then breed some, not all of them. But remember, not all of them will start on day zero because some of them will be in an asterisk. So it can take a long time. By the end of that 90 day breeding season on that study, you had 80% of the cows bred. All right, now let's talk about the bus indicus. That was a crossbred. So with bus indicus, the situation is worse because remember, a large proportion of those cows on the beginning of the breeding season, they will be in an asterisk. They are not gonna be cycling. So on that study that is published, 
just a natural breeding with no synchronization. You see, by the end of a 90 day breeding season, all we had was a 40% of the cows are pregnant. If you remember the data from Victor Mercadante this morning, he showed the efficiency of the Brazilian system and the American system, he showed how many pounds of meat they are produced in Brazil. If you go, if you think about it all the way back to breeding, that's one of the reasons is because it's heavily based on boss indicus and no synchronization. So that means not every cow is gonna get pregnant on their breeding season. Some of them will get, will, will get bred really late. So they will win small calves and that's not gonna bring a lot of meat. So again, on average, 5% of our cycling animals will display asterisks every day on that 21 day interval. And from here, we can go a little bit into asterisk synchronization. So what would be the advantage of synchronizing asterisks, not letting them come, you know, uh, at a random 5% uh, a day? So here's some advantages. And so we're trying to give Mario a break here talking so he doesn't have to talk the whole time. <laughs> so when you think about advantages of estrus synchronization, right? So this is, yeah, go ahead, sorry. So can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, no. So, so, so here my point. Uh, thanks, guy. Uh, here my point is uh, by by the decision of the management of this ranch, which is our university ranch, we wanted the calves to be at least to 110 days at the moment of winning. That means the youngest calf, the one that was calf latest, should have at least 210 days at that day of winning. Everybody else is gonna be older. But what you wanna have and really wanna have is a bunch of them you know, like concentrated here in the beginning. So they'll be much way older than 210. So that's not early winning, it's just a regular winning. So 200, 210 days is like the minimum. The youngest calf here born should have at least 210 days at that day of winning. That was it. That was what I was trying to say. That answer your question. Okay. So uh, there'll be a there'll be a philosophical question. <laughs> Uh, if you talk to, 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 to our manager, for example, he'll say he hates early winning across the board. He says, man, you must uh, 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 harvest the full potential of the mama cow, which is to give milk and you know, sustain the growth of that calf. If, if, if a mama cow cannot give enough milk to that calf, she's not good enough to be here. So he'll, he'll have that philosophy. But then in terms of management for a prima pair, so it, it's a heifer, she got, she got bred as a yearling heifer. Now she's, and then she, and then she kept a two year old, she's still growing. She could really use some benefit, you know, of reducing the demand, the energetic demand on her as she has to grow. She would have to produce milk for that calf and they still get bred. So three things, that's too much. So then in some systems, it is worthwhile to, combined at the beginning of the breeding season with the early weaning of that calf for many reasons. First, because you're gonna, again, remove the burden on that, on that uh, uh, prima pair cow, that first calf heifer. And also because as you remove the calves at the moment of weaning, the cows come in heat like crazy. So we're gonna have a very fertile heat. If you, if you, if you, if you actually enroll that cow in a synchronization program, they must have a seeder put in and you just program that the day you put out the same day of winning, they're gonna come in heat like crazy in 48 hours. That's a very fertile heat, very good opportunity for breeding. So we kind of, I'm, I'm talking about many things at the same time, but philosophically uh, people don't like to do early winning, but for that specific category, it might be a big advantage of doing that for any breed. Yeah.
Yeah, so the, the comment and the, the question again is about early weaning in regards to um, strategies, does it work, does it not in balsamicus, and then thinking about feed cost, high input cost, et cetera. And, you know, at the right moment, uh, we see Felipe Morel walk in the room. So, uh, Felipe, you can come up and, and comment about this. And while he's coming up, I'll just say, you know, Felipe has done a lot with this. One of the big things, and I'm sure he, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the dangerous things that I, that I see here in the state of Texas that we have with people that do early weaning is a lot of times they don't manage the calves correctly. And, and that's a major problem. Um, and I'll, that's my expertise in that area. I'll let Felipe really talk about it. Yeah. So every time you'd say early weaning, uh, we have to be very specific. When are we talking about, right? Because if I do it at five months of age or six months of age, that's, that is early weaning compared to eight, nine months of age, right? Which is a normal wean. When we say early weaning in Florida, that's what we do is at two to three months of age. So the first day of the breeding season, of those cows. So we take the calf off, we put them with the bulls. Now, just reproductive performance, first calf counts, very good. Increased by 30% consistently every single year. So they get 95% bred, bred. And that's a very short window because in 21 days, they're all gonna be cycling, it's gonna work. Mature cows, it has not increased their reproductive performance if they calve in good conditions. Like a body condition score of six, for example, five to six. And if they had the start of breeding season, the body condition score five to six, when we did early weaning, didn't increase their pregnancy rates, all right? So in good condition, multiparous cows hasn't done, done much. Now, those cows have plenty of good condition. They have plenty of feed. Now, now, if you run into situations of drought that you're desperately looking for that, then, then early weaning should be done at any point, Forget it, uh, regardless of the re reproductive performance. Now, the point that Kai made, that's the... Crucial. And that's why a lot of people don't want to do it. They're scared, right? First, you take the calf at that age, two to three months of age. They think it's harder on the calf than later. It's actually, it's not, right? It's much less stressful at that time than later on, on the calf. And uh, you guys can believe me or not, but we've been do doing this for 20 years every year. It is a lot less. Now, there's some key issues with that. First is the first week after early weaning. Okay, so... There are years when it's cold that those calves are gonna have some early, uh, some runny nose, they might have some respiratory problems. But if we do medicated feed for one week, it's gone, everything's fine. Now, the first week is also crucial because you have to be in constant contact with those animals. So you, are, you wean them and you have to go there every day, more than three, four times a day. So we go there every, like four times, every time we go there, we pour a little bit of feed on the feed bunk and we stay there, let them get acclimated to you. And later on, you come back, there will be poop, feces, all uh, urine all over the, the feed bunk because they don't know. They're still jumping on there, playing around. Clean it up, put fresh feed. Keep doing that, that rhythm, right, for the whole week. After one week, those animals are, are ready to fly. So you can put them anywhere. You can put them on pasture with feed. You can put them in a feedlot. If you put them back on pasture with feed, it has to be high quality grass because their room is so small at that time that it don't, doesn't have enough volume to sustain growth just with the forage. So you're talking about one to 2% of supplement of their body weight. 1% if they're on cool season grasses, 2% if they're on warm season grass. Now, but if the best time to put them in a the feedlot is at that time, they gain about 250 grams for every kilo of feed that they consume. That's the most efficient time in their entire life. Plus they are at that window that I showed in the presentation that you can change their reproductive axis, you know, speed up when they're gonna attain puberty. It's a great strategy, but people just don't do it because they're scared what to do, They've never done that. Um, but for first calf counts, it's something that works perfectly. Mature counts you don't need, only if you're running over your feet. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we, we usually recommend people to do it is to feed them in a, in a feedlot. And it doesn't have to be a fancy one. Like we do in accountants. So like just a dry lot, we put the feed bunk in water, it works. So a lot of producers that do, they do the early weaning, they keep them for three months when it's very cold still in Florida. They put a lot of gain 
And then by March, they, they ship them out of the state, right? They send it to Texas, Oklahoma, other places. So it works for some people, but again, it's not perfect, but yeah, it does require labor. There's no, no. We've done some studies that decrease the frequency of supplementation. It's fine, but you still have to go there at least three times a week. Yep. So the question is, um, what are some strategies that can be done from an estrus synchronization point of view, specifically in regards to boss syndicus cattle to shorten that postpartum anestrus? And as soon as I finish these two slides here, Mario is going to tell you all about them. Okay. Um, great discussion. So, you know, the, the thing that I want people to leave here with is when you use estrus synchronization, you don't have to pair it with AI. Okay. Estrus synchronization is separate from artificial insemination. They work well together, but they don't have to go together. Estrus synchronization and bull breeding can go together just fine as well. So there's opportunities to decrease that postpartum interval, et cetera, uh, in, in capture value from bull breeding. So one thing is you can facilitate the use of AI to reduce or eliminate estrus detection, increase the proportion of early calving females, which uh, Mario talked about, concentrated your calving season, um, uniform offspring and group management, talking about you know early weaning, talking about marketing calves, everything that goes into that. More rapid progeny on young sires, being able to inject young genetics into your herd quite rapidly before you, know, um, you would have access to those bulls. Facilitate crossbreeding. You can make terminal crosses. You can make all kinds of different crosses where you can have a very small operation and do different things. Um, control the spread of things like trick. Um, for you all that are in the state of Texas as producers, you know that this is a major challenge. And I can tell you, the last thing you want is trick within your herd, okay? We've got a major, a big herd right now that has trick, and we have a three-year plan to try to get trick out of the herd, three years to get it out. So it's a very problematic situation um, that, that is an issue. Um, maximize the use of facilities and personnel. A lot of times I hear from people, the situation of estrus synchronization and AI takes more labor and more time. Well. If we spend $100,000 to build a barn, for example, and we use that barn once a year, our investment, return on investment out of that barn is pretty poor, if you think about it. We spend a lot of money to build it and we're not using it very often. So instead of sometimes thinking about how much our labor cost is, you know, think about strategies that we're capturing more value out of our facilities or capturing more value by selling a higher genetic merit animal at the end of the day or calves that are more uniform or whatever it might be for that return. And I understand it's, it's hard. We think about reproductive in inefficiency. And you know, if I have a hundred dollar bill in my pocket and Boyd comes up and tries to take the hundred dollar bill out of my pocket, I'm gonna know that, right? I'm gonna try to do everything I can to avoid from him taking that hundred dollars from me. But that's not how reproductive efficiency and inefficiency works. The hundred dollars was never in my pocket. So we didn't know we lost it. That's what the reality of reproductive inefficiency is. You never have captured the money. So you didn't know you lost it. It's just when you add it all up at the end of the year, it's not there. So you have to think about it in a little bit more uh, proactive way. And it, estrus synchronization gets us into more advanced technology as we move forward. So Mario is gonna tell us what are the tools, what can we do? Um, what has years of research got us to from an estrus synchronization point of view to answer your question? Thanks, Kai. All right, are you guys ready to synchronize and be able to synchronize estrus? You understand now what is estrus? You understand how if how beneficial would that be to uh, have your cow showing estrus at the beginning of the breeding season, get them all bred early so that you're gonna win hybrid caps and all that. So how do you synchronize them? How was that? How was synchronization developed over the years? And to synchronize a cow is to manage the ovary manage how the ovary works. And when I talk about the ovary, we, we have to recognize two structures that will be present in the ovary, be the follicle 
and here will be the corpus luteum. Usually there'll be a bunch of follicles. I'm just showing this one because it's the big one, but there'll be many follicles here in the ovary, and there are two ovaries and the corpus luteum. Knowing these two structures and knowing how they change across the astral cycle is what allowed us to figure out how to manage these two structures in the ovary so that we synchronize estrus and we can predict when the estrus is gonna happen in the cows. So that was then through uh, uh, many years of transrectal ultrasonography started to become more popular in the 80s. With the uh, uh, ultrasonography, you were able to observe the ovaries and we realized that there were follicles, there were small follicles, medium follicles and dominant follicles. And these follicles, they would grow, that means increase in size and regress, decrease in size in a dynamic and predictable fashion. By knowing that dynamics of follicle growth, then next step was, can we manage it? Can we control it? And then by controlling the growth of these follicles in a temporal manner, in a time manner, then we're able to synchronize heat. So remember, this is estrus, and again, on average, about 21 days between each, uh, 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 between the moment a cow displays estrus and the, the moment she will display it again. And why is it 21 days? Because there is very complex regulation that goes on during those 21 days. And by the end of that time, she will show heat. I'm not going to go into all the details of this graph, but it shows that the follicles will grow in a wave pattern from very small, they will grow until become very big. That happens one time, first wave, two times, second wave, and third time, three waves. That last wave is the ovulatory wave. The result of the growth of the follicles from here on that wave will result in an ovulation. And what is an ovulation? Ovulation is the release of an egg to the reproductive tract so that if the cows receive semen through natural breeding or through an AI, that will become an embryo and a gestation will start. So these first two waves here, they are non-ovulatory. There's no ovulation. So although the follicles grow, there's no release of an oocyte. These follicles actually will decrease, they will regress and they will disappear from the ovary. But that last wave, which in the cow is usually two or three, it mostly cows will have either two or three waves in their cycle. So a two wave cycle is a shorter cycle and a three wave cycle is a little bit longer. That's why I said 21 days and that's the average. But that last wave is the one that matters because that's the one that will result in an ovulation. That's what we need. And before the ovulation, that cow will show heat. So think about it. First, the cow becomes available to be mounted in a natural service world. There'll be a bull that, that, that would be here. And you know, if she allows to be bred, that means she will allow the male uh, gametes, the sperm, to be deposited in her reproductive tract. On her side, she'll be a few hours later ovulating and releasing the female gamete, and the combination of the two makes an embryo and a gestation. So this is like, this is the sequence. And, you know, it's, if the, that cow is not bred, it's going to be one natural cycle, another, 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 and for a long time. Very good. These are the main events that happen at the very, uh, at the very end of the astral cycle. So at the very end of the astral cycle, there'll be a very large follicle. Remember the follicles? So that follicle will grow, and that's about 12, 13 millimeters, half an inch more or less. Inside that follicle, there's an egg. It's right there, represented here. When that follicle is really large, it secretes a hormone. It's called estradiol. And estradiols go to the brain, goes to the brain of that heifer or that cow and tell her, hey, change your behavior. Now you're going to show estrous behavior. That means you're going to stand to be mounted. You're going to talk a lot. You're going to walk like crazy. Or then it also sensitizes her reproductive tract. She'll release mucus. She'll have some kind of an edema on her vagina. She'll, so that estradiol will activate a series of changes that can be observable in that animal. 
That is the actual dial from that follicle there. Again, one of her behavior changes right here in her little brain, she's now, man, you know, if somebody comes here and tries to mount me, I'm just going to stay put. That's part of her behavior. And that's what she's doing. And that's for our advantage. Because then if you do have a extra detection patch right there, it's going to be rubbed. And even if you're not there in our horse or in that fence, just looking at her and seeing that happening like this, that at this moment I was there taking a picture. But if you're not, not there, but we observe this, we say, hey, this cow has shown heat because that patch has been rubbed, has been rubbed because she stood and she only stood because she's in the heat. Clear that sequence? Good. Now, if we could determine the exact moment that that heat started, two the clock, 28 to 30 hours after the beginning of that estrous behavior, she will ovulate. What is ovulation? I already explained, but it is a release of an egg. So that whole fluid that's inside comes out of that follicle and that expels that egg, that oocyte that's now in the reproductive tract to be fertilized. So that happens about 28, exactly 28 to 30, to 30 hours after the beginning of estrus. And then what used to be a follicle, now those cells differentiate and now it's like the corpus luteum there will be present right there in the next extra cycle. That's the sequence. Large follicle, estrus, ovulation, and then whatever used to be a follicle now is the corpus luteum that's present on the next estro cycle. So what is estro synchronization? Now that you know everything that's happening at the end, we want that estrus behavior and everything that happens after, which is ovulation, Formation of corpus luteum, we want that to happen at the moment that we predict and that we program. Now comes the protocols and all that story, and uh, uh, Kai will talk about it. But let me just tell you what do we need to do in every single protocol that doesn't change. Those are the principles. We want to mimic that last wave of the astro cycle, but independent and in what is the stage of the astro cycle that the animals are, which will be random. Some will be here, some will be here, some will be here, some will be there. We want them all to behave, to control, we want to control their, their astro cycle so that we'll get them all to behave as if they were on the last wave of their astro cycle. Have to do three things. First thing is to program follicle recruitment. That means we want to program a new, the emergence of a new wave of follicle development. Second, we need to induce corpus luteum regression. As long as we have a progesterone, which is produced by the corpus luteum here, this orange line, there's not gonna be any ovulation. We will need to remove that, we need to induce CL regression. And the last thing we wanna do is after we do those, these two things, we want to program the moment that the follicle ovulates so they, it doesn't do it uh, at random, at, you know, we, we want the ovulation to happen at the moment that we program it to. So we will induce ovulation. How do we do these things? Using drugs, using hormones in a logical and rational way. So the, pro the, 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 the drugs we have that are uh, lawfully available in the United States are prostaglandin, and here are the, all the commercial uh, uh, names of products that are available in the US, GNRH, and here are, are the products. I just took these pictures because these were the ones that I were in my hand at the moment. I don't work for any of these companies. Any of these should work if you just read the specifications and follow the manufacturer's instructions. Then you should have a projection source, which could be a sitter, which is something like this that you insert in the vagina of the cow, or MGA, which is a feeding supplement. And then we also like to use the Astrotec as an indicator of Astro's behavior. So this is what we have to do in a very summarized way. The first thing we need to do, remember, program follicle recruitment. How do we do that? We give an injection of a GnRH. And what it does, if there is a large follicle in that ovary, it will cause its ovulation. As we ovulate that follicle, it will lose its dominance and then it will allow a new wave of follicle to start to grow. At the same time, we'll insert a projection releasing device, which is a seeder. So we have to do these two things in the beginning. Put a seeder, 
and they give an injection of GnRH. They will program follicle recruitment. That's the first uh, step in the synchronization program. The second thing we have to do, and I told you, is to induce CL regression. And we do that by an injection of prostaglandin. So prostaglandin kills the corpus luteum. Why is that necessary? That's necessary because we need the progesterone to go down. Otherwise, there will be no ovulation. And we also remove that progesterone releasing device. So we move the sitter. There's no more exogenous progesterone. We kill the CL. So there's no more endogenous progesterone. Now, man, that follicle will have the condition it needs to continue to grow and to achieve its final growth to the point that will show estrus. That's done by uh, an injection of prostaglandin. And then the last step is to induce ovulation. So at this moment, they will remove the seeder and we gave the prostaglandin. We usually, at that moment, we add a, a estrus detection patch to the cows so that we'll know if they show estrus because then, you know, go there next day and they will be activated like this. That means that they showed estrus. So at that moment, we should have a large follicle which produces a lot of estradiol. And what happens? The cow will show heat. But we want to do, we want to induce ovulation. We don't want them to come in, in heat at any, in, in, uh, at any random time. We want to program the moment that that follicle will be ovulated. And the, the, the way we do this is through, is through a second injection of GnRH. So GnRH causes ovulation of that follicle at a programmed time. So if you do that, then you can inseminate them, you can time inseminate them, everybody at the same time and do time AI. Or you can do split time AI like Kai mentioned before. Or you can do asterisk observation and then breed that asterisk, whatever you want to do. This is just a, the, the, the most classical protocol, not the oldest one, but the one that really popularized the use of this kind of methodology. So as an example, they give the GnRH here on day zero. Seven days later, they give an injection of prostaglandin to regress that corpus luteum. And then at the recommendation at that time, 48 hours later, you give an injection of GnRH that will induce ovulation of that follicle that's growing. It was, see, it was recruited here, kept growing. At that moment, you give an injection of GnRH and then you inseminate it 16 to 24 hours later as a fixed time and you got the cows pregnant. So this is one example of the protocols using those principles that I just described to you. Now, of course, protocols have developed to many more. Oh, what I heard yesterday, 44 that we have published in the, in the, in the Replicative uh, Task Force website. And uh, Kyle will discuss a little bit about them. So yeah, so currently today, um, we publish individualized sheets from the Beef Reproductive Task Force, one for in cows, as you can see here, one for in beef heifers, which is here, and then one for sex semen. And just so you know what goes into the, these protocols getting onto these sheets, they've been tested in multiple locations, multiple breed types, all different environments, et cetera, to really prove to us that they work, okay? So for example, like the seven-day co-sync protocol plus cedar right here in cows for fixed time AI, this protocol has been used on hundreds of thousands of animals with very acceptable pregnancy rates. And thus is the reason that it remains on the sheet today. We have a boss indicus specific protocol. We have protocols where you do heat detection and time AI, solely heat detection, and then fixed time AI. Same thing is true on the heifer protocols. And then on the sex semen protocols, uh, there's some few differences. And, and if you're interested in sex semen, we can have a discussion about this on different strategies you use to maximize fertility to sex semen. One of the things that I want you to take away from this section is what are reasonable and average pregnancy rates that we can expect in the modern cow herd today from these estrus synchronization programs, okay, in, in different uh, categories of animals. So these are pregnancy rates at day 30 um, in different parity levels, virgin heifers, primiparous cows, and multiparous cows, Bostonicus versus Bostaris, animals that are going undergoing AI to a normal AM PM rule, animals that are undergoing fixed time AI, and then animals that are undergoing embryo transfer. So for example, in a group of primiparous cows that 
a day 30 preg check after an estrus synchronization program and a single AI, on average, the pregnancy rate is going to be about 45%. There's over 100,000 animals that are in these experiments to, to show this. Boss syndicus animals compared to boss tyrus, boss syndicus are going to be about 50%, boss tyrus animals about 56%. And here's the differences in the types of programs you use. If we look at it and we get out to day 100 of gestation, so you take out all the pregnancy loss that occurs up to day 100, there's going to be very little after that unless it's disease induced, which is a whole nother story. Okay, but for normal pregnancy loss, and you say, what's an acceptable pregnancy rate at day 100 of gestation? In multiparous cows at day 100 of gestation from a single ester synchronization in AI, on average, about 47%. Mario's going to show some data here and, and totally unrelated to this, but mirrors this data for their production system in Florida. And this encompasses production systems really from all around the U.S. and South America. So I show you these because these are what realistic expectations, what realistic averages look like. Now we can do a lot better, but in an average, you can also do worse, right? So this is kind of what the numbers look like. And a lot of the strategies that we've talked about at this meeting so far, and we'll talk about tomorrow, are how do we increase these numbers higher than what they currently are? So Mario's going to talk a little bit about the difference between Boss Syndicus and Boss Taurus and what that looks like in regards to a breeding season and, and the influence. Thanks, Guy. So here is a little bit of more information on that same experiment that I showed before. Remember that poor lone bull there? He only got 45% of the cows pregnant by the end of the 90-day breeding season with, with the absence of any synchronization protocol. That is the difference of an experiment, a contemporaneous experiment. It's just another group of animals that were subjected, subjected to one-timed artificial insemination at the day zero here at, of the breeding season. So that slide makes the point of what is the advantage of a synchronization protocol and one round of AI compared to just letting the bull doing its job. So it's one AI, and then I can't remember exactly, but usually the practice is five to 10 days after that AI, you start natural breeding. That means then you put the bulls together with the cows. So this initial pregnancy here, which is about, let's say 38% on that herd, is the pregnancy that resulted from one round of AI. Uh, that's all that was done. And then this is the bull working. See, the bull is working and getting them pregnant. And again, that difference here doesn't change too much. But the first, there are two things here. First, look, at the end of the breeding season, you got a 71% versus 45%. Would you like that as a producer? 25% more. Would you be happy? Would you be happy, Kai? Nobody else is happy. Would you be happy? Good. Now, what I would be really happy is that right here on the first day of the breeding season, first day, I have 90 to go. On the first day, I got 38% pregnant. Kai, do you like that? Yes. Because 38% of my calves, they are, they'll be born on the first day of the calving season. They'll also win heavy. Okay, so that's the result of one round of AI, not because of the AI, because of the synchronization plus AI. Okay, w why? Why did all that happen? Remember, th those, those are boss indicus animals. They have a long anestrus. If you don't do anything to them, they might take 80, 90, 100 days to start cycling. Now here, you give them a protocol. You give them progesterone on that cedar. And one of the things that I'll discuss in the end if I have time, but if not, I'll just do it now. One of the things that that progesterone does, it induces cyclicity. It takes cows out of the anestrus. They will start cycling for you. So even if there's something wrong with the semen or something wrong with your system or something wrong with the inseminator, still you have induced cyclicity. And if they don't get pregnant here to that AI, they will start cycling and then the bull will do its job as soon as the next opportunity comes. Yes. Um, we do that in university just so the vet has absolute, is absolutely certain if a pregnancy is by AI or a pregnancy is by the bull. If you do it like two days later, for, if you do it immediately, for example, you wouldn't know. So if you really want to be able to distinguish, 
you need to give them a little bit of time. Five days is the minimum. If they go exactly 30 days after the AI, they'll distinguish a 25 pregnancy from a 30 day pregnancy for sure. But you know, if it is a little bit uh, between a 30 and a 35, that might, might not be that clear cut. So if you give them 10 days, uh, maybe more experimentally, if your objective is just to get them pregnant, just do it the same day, whatever you wanna do. You sure, or change breeds, right. Everybody with me here, do you guys see the, 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 the difference and the advantage of astro synchronization is this is that's the advantage right there, and it carries all the way through to the end. Very good. I'm going to show with you now a couple of papers, and and you see you guys on the are on the last experience course, but you'll see this very cool information that I didn't show on the previous course. So this is a uh, these are two papers. One published this year, another one published last year. And that's and this is a computer model. Okay, so this guy is not working with the cattle. He's, he's getting information from herds and he's making a simulation on the computer. Very well done, very complete, very well uh, designed and established from a hypothetical 400 animal herd. Okay, and he's comparing the reproductive performance on this paper and the economic performance in the next paper of a series of strategies of, of reproductive management strategies. I'm just gonna show you two, the two more basic because I just show you that same example. One is only natural mount, only bulls. The second one is the one that I just showed you as well, which is one protocol of time artificial insemination followed by bulls. The other ones is resync and two resyncs, so more complex. So let's just keep simple. Did you get did you get it? So two very simple systems, just like I showed before. Only natural breeding or natural or one opportunity of time AI followed by natural breeding on a 90-day breeding season. Very good. That that's a complex table, but just look here on on, 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 uh, on the top of this rail line. First, this is total born. So by that simulation, you'd have, if you just do only natural amount from 400 animals, you'd have 200 calves. Now, if you do one time AI plus natural amount, it goes to 250 calves. Can you see that? That's base, you can kind of see that that's kind of why we're going here. And this is a boss indicus operation on those conditions. This is all that could get. And the point here is that you see if that's 25% uh, more calves just because you did one time AI on that same length of a breeding season. Very good. It's a simulation and that simulation was run 32 times for each condition. These are all the conditions here. I'm just gonna show you two conditions. This is the natural breeding only and that's the total weight of your weaned calves. You just do one, you just do natural breeding. This is what you're gonna get between 31,000 and 33,000 kilos. You just include one round of artificial insemination and then do natural breeding, that second model. Then you go to between 43 and 45,000 kilos. Would you like to have that, okay? A, few, a little bit more money in your pocket, right? So. It's a computer simulation, and then you know it goes up. The more intense you do your technologies, but you know this is for the last experience. We're just going for the very basic one round of AI, and then natural breeding, and that's how much more uh, calf weight you're gonna get in your pocket. Very good. What else do we get when you compare only natural amount with the one time AI plus natural amount? Well, we should expect this you have a much greater concentration of birds in your first month of the breeding season compared with what you want to do only natural amount. Remember, the bull will work steadily, but surely, but you know, like a little bit on the second, the third, and on the fourth. While you do that AI on the very first day of the breeding season, you're gonna have a large concentration of birds on the first, on the, well, here's the second month of that calving season. You like to have that. Because then when because the winning date is fixed, 
you're going to have a whole bunch more of heavy calves because they, they, they were born earlier. They were born on the second month of the calving season. They're not spread as much like in that round bell, uh, that, 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 that bell shelf curve. Do you guys see that? Do you understand how that come about? That's just because of that one round of artificial insemination after synchronization of the astro cycle. And that's the second paper, just came out this year, and that's the economic analysis. And, and the, the data is just right here. And what I'm showing you here is on that, those same two systems, only natural amount, or one time AI plus natural amount, the gross margin. So with, with a cost analysis and with, a, with, with whatever parameters they put in their models, you know, welcome to take a look at this paper. It goes from $21,000 to $26,000, of course, because of everything we discussed, you know, the, uh, the, the, you're gonna have a lot more calves to sell, so it's, you're gonna produce a lot more output. So this is real, uh, I mean, this is not real, it is a simulation, but it's not unreal, it's been published and it's, it's through serious research. So please take a look at these papers and see if you get convinced of how useful would it be to do a one round of synchronization and insemination and then natural amount compared to just natural amount? Uh, yes. So one of the things I want, I want to leave some time for questions and I just want to add one point to the data that Mario just showed. Those simulations are based on real world data to start them with. So it wasn't like the people sitting around just pulled the data out of the air to start those uh, simulations. They used real data to mimic the simulations and repeat them over and over again and, and um, are, are really, really nicely shown. So as we're running out of time here, um, want to mention two things. So beefrepro.org has a lot of tools on it. One is the Estra Synchronization Planner, which is this situation uh, right here where you can download an Excel file, you can make programs, you can make calendars, et cetera. But we're really happy and excited to announce that very shortly it's going to come out in a web-based version. So you're just going to go to a web page and be able to do all these exact things where you can select the cow or heifer, semen type, breed type, system type, gene age, prostaglandin, whatever, and generate a calendar that way um, where it just spits it out right there. So this is going to be coming. So just keep your eye out and, and, uh, and you'll see that coming forward. Okay, take home points. Um, it's important that, you know, I hope you took away from this, estrus is important, and these protocols have been developed to maximize estrus expression, right? Um, estrus synchronization is a powerful tool that has many options. It's not a one-size-fits-all. There's 44 protocols that are in the estrus synchronization planner today. We don't all have to use the same one. I would say our goal from the Beef Reproductive Task Force is that you use one of them, um, and whether you use it with natural service, whether you use it with a time AI and natural service, whatever fits your operation, um, do that. Different breeds respond differently. Bostonicus versus Bostaris. Number of AI companies here this week sponsoring it, visit with them. Each state has an extension system with a lot of educated people that can help um, ask those. We have an Ask the Expert tab on BeFreePro.org. Please use that. We try to answer those questions as rapidly as they come in. And, you know, Mario and I would just like to thank everybody for um, spending the afternoon with us and, and uh, we'll take time for any questions that anybody has here in the last five minutes. Questions? Any questions? Yes. So, yeah, so you, so there's two, well, yeah, they can either use it, you can either use MGA and feed it, or you can use a seeder and put it in, you know, and do a intravaginal device. MGA works great. The problem with MGA is if you're not set up to feed it and have the carrier set up to deliver it, you start to get sporadic heats because they're not intaking it in the normal situation. So um, unless someone is set up to feed it, I always recommend going the seeder route. Now, if you're set up to feed it, it works very well. There's no difference in, in, um, in the effectiveness and those protocols are on the sheet still today. Good question. And one thing that I'll just mention, I, I said this earlier, when we look at all these drugs and including MJ because it falls in that category, I get calls and questions all the time like, hey, you know, this drug's not working. The effectiveness 
of the drugs and the way that they're produced, it's highly unlikely that there was something wrong in the manufacturing process of the drug. Most of the time, it's not us following the label, either for use or for storage, okay? A lot of the GNRH products require refrigeration. They do not need to be on the, de on the dashboard of our truck in the 100 degree weather, right? That's number one thing that will toast them. Um, so just keep that in mind when you when you think about it and you know where you keep your drugs, et cetera, and be smart about that. Other questions? Okay, so as we wrap up this section, we got about a 15 minute or 20 minute break here um, before the last section starts at five o'clock about um, beef on dairy and branded beef programs. So go ahead and take a little break, stretch your legs, get something to drink, and we'll see everybody in the last session for the day uh, in the big room. Thank you. <laughs>